Okay. Um, so the first topic we're gonna talk today is um, centralized versus distributed databases. The concept of centralized and decentralized. Um, it, it, it's a little bit hard to formally define it. I was trying to find uh, proper definitions and it seems the authors are not really, um, there, there is no agreement whether like what exactly distributed versus decentralized means in the database space. Um, so normally in the, um, uh, conventional computing, um, the word distributed means that a particular resource is spread in the kind of a physical locations, multiple physical locations, but the management or the kind of a control mechanisms can be centralized, right? So a distributed system can be centrally controlled, uh, whereas decentralized system cannot be centrally controlled. It means it's not only distributed, but it's also the control is distributed, right? Uh, so that's what it means in terms of normal kind of a distributed computing. But in context of databases, it is a little bit tricky because most authors, they use the term decentralized and distributed the same way. Um, so I prefer to call it distributed uh, because most authors kind of call it distributed, uh, distributed databases. So we have the centralized model is relatively straightforward. You basically have a single schema. So you model your domain using a single schema, like uh, in the relational databases, it might be your definition of, of your relations and your tables. And then you manage everything on a single server. So you, of course you can have multiple clients making multiple queries to your database, but they all use the same uh, perspective and they all use the same uh, mechanisms to access the database and they see the world the same way, right? Um, so the centralized database basically is ha has those two properties and you have some benefits by, by doing that. So the, the biggest benefit is that it's easy. Um, it's easy to, um, to do updates, it's easy to manage that, it's easy to design it, um, to back it up. Uh, and then it's actually very efficient to run queries on it because you have everything in one place. So you don't have any network overheads or you don't have, um, you don't have um, additional costs of running joins or running queries, right? Uh, but it has some, ben some, some drawbacks as well. So it, it has kind of a single point of failure. So if, uh, if the single server kind of fails, then you know the system doesn't work anymore. So you could have the centralized approach follow exactly the same thing, but you could say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do some load balancing and I can kind of um, distribute the queries to route them through multiple servers, right? But that, that is already quite problematic because for, um, so if I add, so imagine that uh, I want to add servers for read, right? Then it's okay. Uh, I can add additional servers which are reading from my database, kind of read only. Um, and then I don't need to worry about the data consistency. And then I can route my traffic through multiple servers kind of uh, making the, the, the queries. So even though I have a single file, let's say for my database, I can kind of route the queries uh, from multiple kind of a query engine or kind of uh, database systems. Uh, so I could in theory add servers for read only without changing anything and it would kind of still work, right? So it, it is, we, we could kind of call it centralized plus plus, right? We, we don't have everything on a single server, but we don't really changing here much uh, because we don't need to. And then we can multiplex the incoming queries through multiple servers. That's what we do for web load balancing, right? We have a kind of a single web server, but to balance the load on that single web server, we often do split it into multiple kind of um, web servers, which route 
individual queries separately, right? Um, so then I can mitigate um, this point potentially, right? Um, and then I can kind of mitigate potentially the, um, the performance bottleneck as well. But there are some other drawbacks. So we often deal with big data. And in big data, I have such a huge volume of data that I cannot really store it in a physical, single physical location. I, I do need to spread it. Also, if I have immense number of data and I need to run a query, maybe the running the queries for running the queries, I cannot really do that on a single server anymore. I need to have kind of a distributed computing facilities to to make it a little bit more efficient, right? So um, the single centralized model is not suitable for kind of a, for big data type of um, data storage. Okay, so what's the alternative? Well, alternative is that I have so-called distributed model and I have multiple data models and schemas by design and I have by design multiple servers which can which are responsible for those different data models and, and data schemas. So I don't have um, a single point of failure anymore. Um, and I have a scalable performance because I can keep adding uh, new servers I, or keep partitioning my data more and more to, to kind of scale my queries and scale the capabilities of my database system. But I have now two problems. Uh, the, the first one is serious um, because I need to maintain data consistency. I need to make sure that if I have those multiple moving parts and one of those moving parts is doing an update that other moving parts which are reading the data don't see inconsistent view that I don't have kind of a consistency problem. Um, so the second problem is everything is more complex. It's harder to design it. Uh, it's harder to logistically organize it. It's harder to do replication, uh, backups and so on. But those are not too hard. Th this is hard, right? Um, so the, the problem of maintaining data consistency, that is kind of the challenge of uh, distributed or decentralized databases. Um, so how can we do? How can we split um, normal single schema database? How can we partition it? So if you think about it, for the traditional um, SQL uh, database relational model, um, what do we have? We effectively have tables and each table has rows, which are our kind of attributes, and uh, I mean columns, and we have rows, which are sort of our data items. So if you, in the traditional SQL model, if you think about it, like the, the, the natural way of partitioning our data is grouping them by tables first. So if I have multiple tables, I can manage multiple tables separately. So I can have one table in one location and another table in another location. And then if a person is doing a query on this table, it has no effect on the other one and vice versa. We do have a problem with joins, right? So if I'm doing read, which requires a join, I have to communicate between those two locations. And then if I'm doing an update, which affects the other table, I have to synchronize across the across those two locations, right? So distributing across the database by tables kind of doesn't really make sense. And also if I'm like, if I have a table which is heavily used, it doesn't help me in, in performance if you know other tables are somewhere else. Um, because this one is heavily used, it's used to the point of like, I really need more performance, then what can I do? So if you think about single table, you can partition data uh, horizontally 
which is by grouping rows, similar rows in a single kind of a, a way, or you can partition it vertically by, by organizing the attributes differently, right? And partitioning it vertically basically means splitting it into separate tables, right? So we back to the original, the, the first idea that we can isolate different tables into different locations. So we kind of, so the, the first model which we were discussing about the tables is really a kind of a special case of the uh, vertical partitioning. So we basically have two ways of, of partitioning, uh, horizontal and vertical. Um, and they have some kind of a benefits and, and some drawbacks, right? So we will come back to that in, in a second. Um, we will kind of sidetrack a little bit uh, into the, because now we decided that we, we gonna partition it and spread it across multiple locations, multiple servers, right? So we have some assumptions to make and a lot of programmers when they deal with the um, distributed computing, they kind of make implicitly some assumptions which are not true. Right, so we have um, in Sun Microsystems in kind of uh, 70s and, and 80s, they came up with those um, seven fallacies. And then James Gosling, which is the, the father of Java, he kind of added one extra one a couple of years later. And we generally discuss kind of a fallacies of distributed computing kind of uh, using those eight primitives. So, the first one says that the network is reliable and that is the source of our problem, right? The source of our problem is that because network is not reliable, we cannot guarantee certain properties of data synchronization uh, because we don't know what will fail, right? Um, the second one is that there is no latency, that things happen instantaneously. Um, that we can push data back and forth, that the bandwidth is, you know, uh, infinite, and also that, that the transport is zero, right? That we can push data back and forth as much as we want, and it, it doesn't matter. Um, and then we have um, three properties related to the network itself, which is that the network is secure, uh, that there is only one administrator and that the topology of the network doesn't change. Um, this one is kind of related to, um, to this one. And it basically means that some things that work in some part of the network may not work the same in another part because the network is not homogeneous. The delays, the latencies, the costs and so on are not uniform, they, they vary. All right, so why do you think those, um, those fallacies are important and what they lead to? Anyone? So when, when you're developing a, a mobile apps or some other kind of uh, applications that rely on, on the network, you often need to deal with those things, right? So the first one, the fact that you can lose network connectivity, um, what does it mean? If you are a programmer and if you don't take in this into account, what, what will happen? Yeah, Nikolai? Yeah, well, uh, for the first one, I think that there could be some loss of data from the client side, I guess, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, there are several edge cases that isn't covered if you think that the network is all, always reliable. Yeah, that's right. So if we say... Um, Outcomes. So loss of data, that's a good one. Loss of data. What else? Uh, 
less less serious. What else can happen? You know, your your app can get stuck, right? Uh, which means they are waiting for something to happen, but it never happens, and they never kind of recover. So. You know, you, you are waiting for a packet to come or for some data to come. The network became unreliable and, you know, the app just continues to wait, right? So apps can get stuck. Apps can get uh, unexpected, unexpected timeouts, right? Which are not, uh, they were not uh, pre like um, forecasted. What else can happen? I, I when I pre, when I was preparing the lecture, I actually got sidetracked a little bit, and I, I was reading uh, what was your most hideous piece of source code that you've seen <laughs> article on on Quora, right? Um, so I I don't know what what was mine, but one of the authors of uh, who replied to this to this question. Uh, he said that um, there was a piece of code which was trying to do something with the network. And when it failed, it put itself to sleep, waited 10 seconds, and then retried. And then when the second time it failed, it doubled the wait time. So it put itself to sleep for 20 seconds, and then it retried. And it was an infinite loop. <laughs> so it, it was basically trying to achieve whatever it was trying to achieve by putting itself to sleep for longer and longer period, and then just retrying whatever, whatever the initial thing was. Um, we should not do that, right? <laughs> um, all right, so um, there are, um, um, what, what are, for example, uh, results of not taking this into account? What you can have if you, Assume there is only one administrator. So what can happen if there are two administrators? Uh, I just have one thought. I don't know if that would make sense, but that they can overwrite each other and things. Exactly, exactly. So you can have, if you have two admins, they can have conflicting, conflicting policies. <laughs> or overwriting each other. Uh, and then you get kind of a problems as well, right? Uh, so you have to have some mechanisms for the, for preventing this. So if you if you assume there is only one admin, you, you just don't care because you say, oh, yeah, it's just one admin, right? Everything will always be consistent. But no, you know, databases have multiple admins and they may introduce policies or rules which are contradicting or conflicting and then you have chaos, right? Um, well, um, the, the other ones are kind of a more in, um, uh, intimate, like you, you need to deal with them a little bit more, like for example, about the topology. Um, so uh, one thing that we often do is we, for example, do some load balancing, right? So we may say, okay, I need to pick kind of at the next resource to, uh, to do this particular task. But I, I kind of know historically that um, a particular kind of link had a certain latency or had, had a certain uh, delay, right? Um, so I can kind of ask, uh, or, you know, put it into a list, sort it, and just pick always the one which had the, the smallest latency. But the topology may change. And the one which had the, la the smallest latency now may become kind of very delayed uh, or become an inaccessible, right? So you need to be adaptive. You need to be kind of re-evaluating your assumptions because the topology can change and because the network is not homogeneous um, and so on. So like, I don't want to spend kind of more time on this. Uh, you can go to, um, to Wikipedia or some other source and kind of uh, uh, check what are the, uh, the possible um, outcomes, right, of um, of making those kind of a fallacious uh, assumptions. All right, so we kind of got into this horizontal versus vertical scaling. Um, so, what um, 
if you have a kind of a large database, how would you do uh, the horizontal one? So give me an example of kind of a horizontal um, scaling that kind of makes sense. Let's say we storing, um, we're doing a database for NTNU and we want to store all data about students. So some personal data about students, um, the IDs, the courses that take and, and so on and, and so forth, right? So we have some sort of relations, we organize it into tables and now it's one giant database and we say, okay, let's, uh, let's partition it. Let's kind of uh, do some horizontal scaling. So what could you do? Yeah, Tomasz. Oh, definitely, I would go for some kind of the logical clustering of uh, data, like uh, one course, one location, uh, something to avoid uh, possible connections between the databases. Okay. So okay. Keep, keep them kind of the contextual uh, joined, like uh, one class, uh, one. Uh, uh, one course or something like that. Try not to mix them. Uh, it will be kind of the first uh, first approach. Mm -hmm. And then I will see if this kind of clustering uh, gives a satisfactory number of uh, databases and uh, and the amount of data in a single database. If I need to find refine. Do some more in uh, more uh, uh, dividing of data. Yeah. So, for example, if we pick the location, so if we say all data related to Trondheim sits in kind of a one database, and all data related to Jovic sits in another database, we will kind of maximize uh, the probability of people doing queries in Trondheim related to Trondheim data and people doing kind of queries in Jovic related to Jovic data and Jovic students such that we will kind of maximize the benefits and then the queries which are related to both will be kind of minimized, right? So for example, we can say Trondheim versus Jovic partitioning and that's kind of good. And that's an example of a horizontal one, right? Um, horizontal. If we do it per stream, uh, so we, for example, take all the students which are in BPROC 2020, the first, first years, or BPROC in general, and group them into a, a single kind of a database. And then we have students which are, are doing other, other courses. We can also kind of sp split it logically horizontally. Um, horizontal, but we can also think of grouping certain things more logically when we're designing the schema. So we may kind of do a little bit slightly different partitioning of rows and columns in such a way that it kind of makes more sense to be grouped uh, per, co per course or things like this, right? So we could do some vertical uh, uh, adjustments as well. Some there is another term which is used for doing reorganization of our data vertically. Uh, what is it called? It's a process that we often do with SQL databases just to make it less redundant, for example. Uh, it's called normalization, right? Normalization. So normalization is a process like you design your schema, you have your kind of attributes and, and so on, and you see, oh yeah, I need a student ID here, 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 and here. So maybe I will have a table which associates kind of the student ID with some ID or some name. And then I kind of uh, use the reference in all my relations, and then I don't duplicate the data in, in multiple places, right? So we kind of do a normalization of the SQL tables. Um, so yeah, per course, per location. What if I said, okay, I will pick all the rows of students which have an ID uh, less than, I don't know, um, 60,000 to one database and all IDs which are more or equal 6,000 or 60,000, whatever the, the numerical value is, 
uh, into another database. Would that make sense? Can I do this? Yeah, yes and no. So what, what, what would be the benefits? What would be the, the kind of... Uh... Yeah, Tomas? Uh, I think that it is uh, absolutely possible, but it if it is like this, that uh, the one with the number 5999 is closely related to the one with the 6000, then there will be lots of connection. And it's, so this is kind of an arbitrary choice without uh, the 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 dead what the data is but yes. but it's of, of course uh, as possible uh, as, as any other exactly so it is an example of a horizontal splitting of data which is possible of course you can do that and it may or may not make sense right so Tomas is perfectly fine here um, so uh, another example is by age right I can group uh, students by age and it may or may not make sense also. Um, the, it is a little bit related to per, per stream. So, you know, students in the same, like if, if I take a BPROC, uh, BPROC 2017, for example, the, the, the students who are finishing this, uh, no, so this is 18. So the students who are finishing the, the, batch, the bachelor next spring, right, the, the cohort, they will be probably about the same age, but you may get students who are older or students who are younger, right? So this one makes more sense logically because they they form the, the single cohort, but grouping them by age may in, in this particular use case does not really make sense, right? Uh, but again, it's a kind of a, an example of a horizontal um, grouping, horizontal grouping, yeah. Okay, so now let's think about vertical and horizontal, but in the context of uh, how easy it is to manage that. What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of one over the other? So we talked a little bit about the, the vertical ones that if I have some attributes, um, like if I split attributes into two tables and I'm kind of running a table, running a query here and I need a join, then I need to transfer data, right? So for a vertical, um, for vertical uh, queries, they are kind of um, easy for simple queries. Um, joins require data transfer or sync, um, and then writes. Um, yeah, the the reads are. Reads are uh, easy and independent, independent. So it, it scales really well. Uh, and then writes, um, so if I have my table in a single database and I'm doing write to that table, um, that is easy, but the original table had more attributes, which means normally the write will affect more than one table, right? Because I, I, I kind of split it. So some of those logical splittings will kind of work better than others, but writing into a, a single table, of course it's easy, but writing across multiple locations and mul multiple tables, it's, it's not that easy, right? So writes are easy in single location, but not, for um, kind of a multiple, uh, just say multiple locations, right? Um, so then um, for horizontal sp splitting, what are the characteristics? How they differ uh, between the vertical and horizontal? So now I split my data, let's say by cohort. Um, so when I'm doing a read, I, I want to um, check something. Uh, are reads easier than in the vertical case or they like, how would you, how would you assess it? So 
So if we if we go back here and let's say I did a split, a kind of a horizontal split based on the location, right? And now I'm doing reads in Jovic about Jovic. That would be much easier, right? So I only have Jovic data. I'm only doing reads about Jovic data. I'm, I'm saying select something, blah, 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 where location is Jovic, right? Then it's super easy and super performant, right? But what if I did kind of a splitting across the cohorts and now I need to run a query which checks, um, which says uh, something, something, select something, something where location is Jovic, right? Then I need to kind of have a massive join because I need to check uh, from all the locations, uh, like, no, 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 from all the cohorts, what is the location and select the ones which have Jovic, right? So you, you see, uh, it is kind of hard to tell if the reads are easier or harder because it depends, right? Uh, it depends how did how did I split it, right? Uh, so with, with vertical reads, it, 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 there is no dilemma because like if I if I'm saying from so select something from the from restricts what it is and then that's it, right? Uh, if I need to do a join, of course, joins are always tricky when you have a distributed system, but like if I'm just doing kind of reads from a single table, then that's easy. So here it's a little bit tricky because I, I, I don't have a single table like in a single place. I kind of cut it and I have part of my table here and part of my table there. So it kind of depends on the query. Like if I really want to do select from where I only constrain this query to this location, then it's perfect. It's ideal case. But if my query needs kind of both parts, then it sucks, right? So it kind of, it really depends. Um, it really depends on the design, on the schema. Uh, and design, right? So when you're designing, when you're splitting this, you really need to take into account what type of queries will you run because you either will have the ideal case or you will have the worst case, right? Um, it is a little bit similar here for the joints, but for simple reads, it doesn't matter, right? If simple reads are easy. Uh, joints uh, are complicated, but here even simple reads are not easy if you if you split it kind of in the wrong way, right? So as, as we were saying, for example, if you split it um, kind of by age, then almost always you will have to do joints, right? And then it makes no sense. All right, so reads are difficult to answer, right? With horizontal. Um, well, simple queries. <laughs> well, we, we kind of, um, we have to redefine a simple query, right? Here, a simple query means kind of select from a single table, right? Um, here, select from single table is not simple query anymore because it depends of the where clause, right? Uh, because my student's table is now split into Jovic and Trondheim. So if I say select from student's table where location Jovic, then it's a super perfect case. But if I don't say where location Jovic or where location Trondheim, then it becomes a join because I have part of my students here and part here, right? So uh, it's not easy for simple queries anymore. It's uh, kind of a more complex, more complex for simple queries, right? And then joins, of course, joins require data transfer. The, nothing changes here. Uh, and I have even more because I have joints which are caused by the horizontal split, right? I, I'm not only having joints because of different tables, I have joints because I, I split my single table into two locations. So I have students table with the same attributes, but part of the data lives here and part of the data lives there, right? Um, so it is a little bit more complicated. And then um, I have um, writes. So now I, I need to write something, right? Um, and I need a little bit more logic 
because if I need to add a student, I need to know, okay, is this student from Jovik or from Trondheim? Because if it is from Jovik, I need to add it to the Jovik tables. And if it's from Trondheim, I need to add it over there. So I need some demultiplexing of the logic of where the student should go, right? Uh, here, if I, I say, okay, I have all my students table in one place, then it, it is kind of easier, right? So the rights, um, rights require additional logic. So as you see, kind of a vertical splitting wins, right? But vertical splitting has its limits. It, it, it is limited of how much it can achieve. As we were discussing, like uh, you end up with all students in a single table in a single location, which is undesirable. Like you really want to, like, you know, NTNU has 30,000 students. We're running a lot of queries on those students and we can't really afford having it in a single file, single location. We do need to partition it. So what do you do with all those students? Well, you do need to do some form of horizontal, um, horizontal um, decomposition, right? You need to somehow divide them because your student table grows too big, right? I mean, 30,000 is not big, but let's assume it's big. Um, then with the horizontal ones, you have some additional challenges, right? So there is this concept which is called sharding. And sharding is kind of a horizontal partitioning on steroids, right? It is a mechanism to deal with all of this. Um, so instead um, of just doing kind of a naive horizontal um, splitting, horizontal scaling, database systems really do this and do sharding. They, they usually don't do horizontal splitting because it is uh, hard to do and it requires additional things, right? So if I take those, um, those points, and copy it to sharding, then we can discuss how sharding deals with it, okay? So um, with reads, um, it still depends, um, it still depends on how you design your schema, but what sharding do is it plays uh, with index files and it introduces kind of uh, this demultiplexing kind of into the mechanics of how we, we deal with reads. Uh, so you have additional kind of a uh, lookup, which tells you, okay, you want to read this, it is over there, right? Uh, so it automates some of the, um, um, so of course, if it is well designed, and if you split the students into Trondheim and, and Jovik and you say where location Jovik, then of course it's, you know, it will work out perfectly, right? But for the edge cases, like let's say you didn't split it between Jovik and Trondheim, you split it, uh, you know, by, uh, in your schema, you split it by uh, the, the cohorts, right? So we use cohorts to split it. Uh, and we have bprog, we have bprog um, 2019 and so on. You have all the, all the programs. And now when you do the join and when you need to look up certain data related to Jovik, for example, then when, when you did the sharding, there will be index files, which will index for you the locations of the Jovik people in such a way that you can do a little bit better lookup than just doing brute force search on all the uh, items in all the locations, right? So it kind of benefits from additional information in the index files, right? Um, and that kind of re relates to this as well. So again, we have for more complex queries, we have kind of a support from indexes, right? So we have kind of a better indexing to deal with kind of a more complex distributed querying. Um, and then, for joins, um, joins require data transfers. Um, so, um, and we do have joins because of the horizontal split. So we do two tricks here. So one trick, of course, we, we, we do the same trick, which is uh, use indexes. Um, 
kind of a heavier in indexing. Um, but we also do one more, which is we, uh, so sharding, sharding often duplicates data. What does it mean? Well, um, imagine that I have, um, I have students um, that uh, I, I have student records which store your uh, student name, surname, uh, where they live and their student ID. And I often need to look up the ID and the email address or ID and the name. Um, so what I will do is I will not keep my kind of a student uh, data in a single place, I will duplicate it into multiple places such that all the joints, which like if I have locations which um, store course information about BPROC or about a particular course and they are responsible for it, that's my kind of a shard. But it often, uh, it often queries the additional uh, attributes from another table, which somebody else's is in charge. What I will do, I, I will make a read-only copy on my location where the when the particular uh, data is in such a way when that when I'm doing the join, I don't need a network data transfer, right? Um, so network data transfer, but uh, we duplicate the, the, the data such that no network data transfer is needed. Of course, I do need to transfer it here and kind of maintain it. So I, I the, the sharding manager will kind of keep the, the copy, the cached copy for the joints, but you know, for every query, I don't need to ask the other location for the data. I kind of have a local copy, right? Uh, so sharding kind of introduces this. And then uh, writes require additional logic. So of course that that's still the case. And then because of the indexes and because of this duplication, it's even more complicated, right? Uh, so it's even more complex than plain vanilla horizontal partitioning or scaling partitioning, right? So. So sharding is kind of a form of horizontal splitting, but plus additional mechanisms. And this additional mechanism is the different uh, additional indexing of what the relations are and who is linked with whom and how to do this. Uh, and then for joints, it's kind of a storing partial or full additional tables such that the joints can be optimized and can kind of cache and reuse the data which is lo locally stored. Some of it is statically done. So sometimes you can have database system which allows you to plan those indexes and plan for what type of queries, what do I need such that the database designer or database manager kind of plans it ahead and in introduces those additional indexes. And some of it is done while the database is working. So the database system will analyze what type of queries and what type of joins are being executed frequently and will basically cache additional data and generate additional indexes to speed up the, the, um, the database itself, right? Does it make sense so far? Yep, Nikolai at least got it. So what do you need to remember is that we have kind of basic two form of database scaling, which is a horizontal or vertical. Horizontal is often not used per se. It is just used as part of sharding. And then to, together with additional mechanism, horizontal scaling kind of offers um, sharding of your databases. And sometimes you do it manually. You manually design how to shard it. And sometimes it is done on the fly by the, by the database to deal with this, uh, with this process by taking advantage of certain regularities in your queries. Um, so um, there is, before we, we have a break, I will um, finish this tr train of thought and introduce additional thing. So we were discussing kind of the, the di distributed nature of the 
uh, of our system. And with sharding, we basically have a situation where we have relatively complex system where individual nodes are responsible for part of the data and they need to kind of synchronize the updates or the reads such that you get a consistent view, right? And there is a kind of a, a, a well-known uh, theorem called, called CAP theorem, uh, which stands from the acronym from those uh, three properties. So consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Uh, partition tolerance basically means that the network became unreachable, that some of your nodes of your distributed system became non-responsive, right? So then we have three properties. And the first one says that you have consistency. What does it mean? It means that um, when we have writes and reads, every time uh, I read something, I will either get the latest version of what the database should have, or there will be a delay or timeout or error, right? So I will never get inconsistent response. So if that if someone kind of stored something about particular student in the database and I'm doing a read, I will either get the latest version or I will get nothing. I, I, I cannot get kind of a version which is uh, old, right? Uh, so I get the most recent updated version or an error. Availability is a different property. It basically means that every time I, I'm trying to read, I will always get data. So if I'm trying uh, to read uh, information about Marius from my database, I will always get it. But there is no guarantee that it's the latest one, right? If somebody updated it, I may get the previous version, the previous copy. I may not get the latest one, but I will always get the response. So the difference between those two is here, I may not get the response, but I, if I get the response, it's always up to date. Here, I always get the response, but you know, sometimes it's the most recent one, sometimes it's not the most recent one, right? Uh, and then this uh, means that um, the system continues to operate even if we have some problems with the network. So even if some nodes become uh, temporarily inaccessible, uh, the network, con like the system, continues to, to work, right? Um, and the CAP theorem says, in the presence of some failure, you have to choose whether you want consistency or whether you want availability, because you cannot have both, right? You, it, it is not possible in the presence of uh, par network failure or partitioning of your, of your database access uh, to have both of these. You, you have to choose to, to have either one or the other. You cannot have both. Um, and then, um, yeah, so if you're choosing consistency over availability, what it means is that your system may uh, not respond. So when there is a particular node going offline or going in, being inaccessible, uh, when you ask the database, okay, give me a record, it may say, oh no, timeout because of the network failure, right? So the data is there, but um, I want the consistent data. And for consistent data, I need the system to sync. And for system to sync, I need the network connectivity. So the system will kind of tell me that it cannot give me the answer, right? So sometimes this consistency is required. Like for example, if, you, if we're talking about financial uh, banking kind of database, right? I, if, when I'm asking a database, what is the account balance of Tomasz? I don't want it to tell me it's yeah, 1000 krona, but it might be updated. I mean, we don't know if it's the latest updated version, right? If he just put an ATM and he, he you know, took out 1000 krona, maybe it's zero, right? But the system will tell me 1000, right? I don't want that. Like if the system cannot guarantee me consistency, I don't want an answer, right? I, I don't want an answer which might be wrong. I, I need a correct answer. So if I'm asking the system, what is the status of Tomasz's bank account? I want an answer or an error. Like if the system can tell me it's thousand, I know it's thousand. And then I can do like 
I might be the ATM, which is like uh, giving him the cash, right? And I'm asking the database, okay, can I give him a thousand krona because he has more than thousand krona? And when I'm asking the system for this for this information, I need an answer which is correct. But sometimes you don't need that uh, requirement. So for for example, you may choose availability over consistency, right? And in this case, the system will always reply to me, right? So for example, if I have if you have a Facebook account and the Facebook needs uh, or some somebody asks, okay, what is the profile of Tomas? Uh, and he just updated it, then it doesn't really matter if I get the very latest updated version or if I get the one he had just before he updated, right? Yeah, maybe the email address is wrong, maybe something, maybe he, he changed his nickname or whatever he updated in his bio, but you know, I'm okay dealing with the version which was just a few moments ago uh, versus not having an answer, right? Um, so this choice needs to be done. Uh, and this choice needs to be done by the designer of the system, right? Uh, and the, the funny thing is that um, um, traditional relational databases usually choose consistency over availability. So most traditional um, S SQL databases they are prioritizing consistency over availability when they do the sharding on when, when they do this kind of a distribution of the resources, right? Um, and, and this is because consistency kind of means um, like fr from the asset properties, the consistency means that your transactions either fail or commit, but fully, you don't end up with kind of inconsistent data, right? Uh, so the traditional database systems, because of the traditional asset guarantees, they usually choose the same, you know, they choose consistency over availability when it comes with the distributed version. And then um, the, uh, the systems which are based around the base philosophy, common in the NoSQL world, they usually choose availability over consistency, right? So more, more often than not, uh, the NoSQL database will prioritize availability and will always give you results, but it will uh, not necessarily give you the latest one, right? Does it make sense? It, it, it can be other way around. I mean, you can have traditional database system which is prioritizing availability and we do have modern uh, uh, relational databases that do prioritize this why why we have that like why some of the very modern sharding mechanisms for rdms kind of pr promote availability over consistency Any idea? It, it is kind of trivial in a sense. So, so the reason why traditional database systems are also offering solutions which are prioritizing availability is because the customers want it. And if the traditional databases would not support it, they would all have to migrate to their competitors or their alternatives, which do support it, right? So you can have both, like using SQL database from Oracle or, or whatever, you can have a sharding solution, which is inconsistent on certain conditions, but is always available. Uh, and in cases where you want this, then you will have it, but it is much easier to prioritize consistency with the traditional database systems because they they have it they were always supporting it they are kind of designed this way um, there are not many uh, no SQL databases which will choose consistency because it's hard it's really hard to to do that and we traditionally um, do consistency differently. We organize the database into documents in such a way that you that, that the atomic updates, the atomic changes that you need, the consistent uh, changes are done on kind of a document level. And 
the sharding is kind of independent of that. So you almost always choose availability over consistency when you're doing sharding in NoSQL databases. I don't know of any example where you would have consistency for, uh, for sharding with NoSQL solution actually. But it may change again for the same reason that you want to cater for some other customers which need that. But most of the time, customers which need consistency, they will go with traditional uh, database uh, schemas. All right, so there is just final note uh, before we have a short break uh, about storage. So databases is a special case uh, of a more general problem of storing files of storing data or any kind of um, item in a kind of a decentralized or distributed storage medium, right? Um, so for example, we have um, uh, StoreJ or Swarm from Ethereum, uh, which are kind of examples of decentralized storage. And the unit of storing is, uh, is a file, right? We, we're not talking about data or documents or relations we kind of talking just about file, right? So it's kind of a simpler case, um, but we still have the same problem. Uh, we have the same fallacies of distributed computing, of course, uh, and we have uh, we we still have to make a choice for consistency consistency over availability if our network becomes partitioned, if some of the nodes don't see each other, right? Um, so question to you, we did discuss IPFS last semester. Uh, so a, a very quick reminder that IPFS is interplanetary file system, which is a file system, which is content addressable. Uh, it is decentralized, distributed, and you store uh, copies of files on your local drive. And then if you have it locally, you just use it. And then if you need it, there is a kind of a circular hash table uh, where you can uh, find out where the file is stored. And then you can kind of load it from that location to your local hard drive and then, then use it, right? So my question to you is, do we have an issue with consistency versus availability when network gets partitioned in IPFS. So let's imagine that I have 20 nodes. Those 20 nodes um, store files. And then 10 of the nodes become inaccessible to another 10. And I'm connected to, this, to, to those 10. What will happen? Uh, so my, my question is, the designers of IPFS, of course, they have the, the same issues as everybody else in, in distributed computing. What did they choose? Did they choose consistency or did they choose availability? Anyone? Yeah, so Thomas is suggesting that they chose availability. Um, so the answer is co consistency is built in. Um, each file is stored by the, is addressable by the content. So it's a, a hash of the content of the file, right? So it is not possible for me to download a, a, a broken file, like download an inconsistent file. Like if I download something, I just check the hash and it has to it has to match because the files are not writable. Um, like if, if the file is stored, it's not uh, mutable. Like I cannot modify that file. I can create a new file, which is a, a modification of the existing file, but it will have a different address, right? So there are no re there are no writes. So kind of they they have. Uh, reads only and writes uh, atomic and not mutable. So I cannot mutate a data, right? I don't have kind of a mutable rights, which means everything in the network is consistent by design. Like it's not possible to have not consistent data, right? But if the network gets partitioned, 
and I don't have a copy of a file and none of the 10 nodes which get partitioned has a copy of the file, then I will not get the file, right? So if the network gets partitioned, the avail availability suffers because I will not get it, right? So I will either get a correct file or I will not get a file at all, right? So uh, they chose consistency, um, consistency and availability availability is a weekly supported by duplicating the data among multiple peers in such a way that the network partition will have limited effect, right? So it is possible that the network gets partitioned, a copy is somewhere here and I can easily get it and everything continues to work fine and I have consistency guaranteed, right? But it may happen that none of those nodes make a copy yet and those the, the network get partitioned and I cannot get the file. That, that, that is possible, right? All right, so let's have um, a five minute break. And then, um, yeah, before the break, do you have any questions? Seems no questions. Um, there is uh, just a note about the CAP theorem. Uh, Cup theorem sometimes, some people say you have to choose two out of three. Uh, that, that's not correct because uh, I mean, we always choose this one. Um, so this one we always choose by default. And then you can on, you only have a choice between those two, right? Uh, you cannot really have a, a distributed system which is partition intolerant because it kind of doesn't make sense you know, the fallacy, like it would mean somebody assumed the network is reliable, which is not, it, it is a fallacy, you cannot assume that, which means you cannot assume that, you know, your network will never get partitioned and you do need to have a partition tolerance, right? So this one is by default, you always have to choose this one by default. And then you can only have a choice between these two. So yes, it is two out of three, but one is already frozen you already chose this one, right? So it's not really any two out of three, it's these two out of these, uh, like one out of these two, right? Uh, because this one, yeah, like we do need to have, we need to have an ability for the system to continue to operate, even if there are some network issues, right? Like, you know, we, we do need to deal with those fallacies. So network is not reliable. Uh, things can go wrong, like uh, bandwidth and latency are not zero. You may have delays, you may have data which gets stuck and takes some time. Uh, and that, during that time, your network is partitioned because you don't have access, right? And so on. So just a kind of a note that it's not two out of three, it's one out of two in the context of three, right? Uh, so don't make this, this mistake. All right, so questions? If no questions, then let's have a short uh, stretch and then we continue um, in five minutes. So 13.27. Um, Good.
All right, everyone is back. Okay, so I, can you hear me? Yes, good. So I, when I was preparing this kind of the, the first part of the lecture, I want, I didn't know if I can squeeze in additional content and I thought I can because the, the database partitioning is not a very complex topic. It, it's it's relatively straightforward. So I was kind of, I thought either talking about this because this is kind of a quite, uh, you know, current, current thing. Uh, and I'm not sure how much you kind of understand um, what, what it means. And the other topic I had was to talk a little bit about Rust, which is kind of a Mozilla based programming language, which I spent some time with as well. But I kind of decided that maybe talking about CPUs will be a little bit more fun for you. Whoops, sorry. Um, so you all heard that Apple is ditching Intel, right? Uh, they will go with ARM for the um, computers and for the laptops and for everything. So the, of course they were using ARM for the mobile devices <clears throat> like uh, phones and tablets, but not for the computers. And they kind of um, go away from the Intel platform. So let's discuss it a little bit. So what is x86? What, what, do you know about x86 what it is what if someone asks you okay can you tell me what x86 is what would you say without googling <laughs> it's a cpu yeah more cpu family okay yeah it's a common standard cpu architecture yes good It has a specific instruction set, very good. Yeah, so all of you are correct. It, it is kind of a, a CPU family. Um, it's a instruction set, which is very common, very prevailive, per pervasive in the, in the world. Um, and all PCs and Apple kind of are using it because Apple is using Intel at the moment, right? Uh, but mobile devices don't use it, right? So we did try to have x86 mobile phones and it didn't really work out. We, we kind of using a different platform for that. So let's sidetrack it a little bit. So let's forget a little bit about Apple and, and in, Intel. Uh, and let's kind of uh, talk a little bit about instruction sets. So CISC versus RISC. Uh, have you he heard of those two terms before? Nope. All right, so let's start with CISC. Complex Instruction Set Computer, CISC. And there is a Wikipedia page and we can... Uh, have a quick look. Uh, and it says, yes, yes, yes. It's a kind of a complex text. I, I'm not gonna kind of bore you with the text. So I will tell you that Intel is an example of CISC. So the x86, the instruction set, which is so common, it's kind of an example of a complex instruction set computer. Uh, and we have kind of a, a quick run through how it happened. Um, so it, it started in you know 1968. 
Uh, we went through the uh, grandfather. Uh, we went through 8086. So my first computer was um, <laughs> 8286, um, which was a 16-bit architecture, and it had, you know, a memory management unit built onto the chip, and so on and so forth. The very interesting one is Pentium Pro. Uh, so Pentium Pro is kind of a, a change, which we'll come back later into. And the other interesting thing is um, is Itanium. So in 2001, there was a, a Windows uh, NT, which was designed and compiled on Itanium platform. And uh, the Intel uh, had some servers which were based on the 64-bit architecture, uh, which was called Itanium, which was not backwards compatible. And because it was not backwards compatible to to what to x86, uh, it failed. So it was a total failure. You you never probably heard of it, and you've never seen it, right? I remember it. I I I, I kind of remember all of those things. I, I even remember 8080, um, 8008, um, because th those were the kind of the the era when I got into computing, kind of a you know mid mid 80s. Um, but you probably never heard of the Itanium. And then two years later, I, AMD came up with the 64-bit architecture for 64-bit computers, which was backwards compatible. And that one took over, right? Uh, so then Intel kind of uh, agreed that, you know, they came up with their own one, which was co compatible with AMD. And then they agreed that they will kind of do this 64-bit uh, architecture. And sometimes, it is called, um, so you see people using a term AMD64 or x86-64. Or x64, right? All of those basically mean the same, but people who use this, they they basically say, well, AMD was first. AMD came up with it, right? And that's true. They, they came up it with uh, a year before Intel, right? Um, Intel licensed the x86 architecture to, um, to Cyrix and to AMD uh, such that they can produce the same like instruction set the way they want, right? So the instruction set is the same, the CPU behaves the same way, but they can design it using their own process, right? Um, so for example, AMD has uh, mastered the seven nanometer and five nanometer architecture, whereas Intel still uses 10 because they have trouble getting their manufacturing into those kind of a lower uh, dimensions, right? Um, so this is the, the other CISC architectures with, uh, which are less known, but this Intel one, the x86 is Kind of if we go back to this is the the prominent example of a CISC architecture right so what is risk well risk is um reduced instruction set computer which follows slightly different design principles um so again if if i go to the wikipedia uh you will see um you, you can read a, a little bit more about it and you can see some of the uh examples of risk and ARM is one of those examples. And then UltraSpark from Sun Microsystems is another one. I spent a couple of years working with UltraSpark and learning about RISC architecture because we've been programming in assembly at the time. Um, so it, it is really different uh, in, in terms of instruction set and in terms of uh, design. So let's very quickly talk about differences. Um, when, when I have program in C, or if I have a program in assembly, uh, I'm using certain instructions to think about my problem and I'm doing some function calls and I'm doing uh, things that kind of make sense to me as a human, right? Um, and then when you don't really have um, a good compiler support and if you don't really have a lot of uh, memory to store programs, uh, you have certain constraints and the, the mapping between your mental model and the actual what CPU is doing, you want it to be quite related, right? So the CISC architecture is um, 
is similar to the way people think um, and to the design of programming languages. So the, the mapping between your program and what the CPU is doing is quite linear. It's, it's kind of the same thing, right? So your CPU uh, is doing what you think it should be doing, right? Um, in risk, you don't care. You don't care about the link between your programming languages and the, the way you think about things to the way what CPU is doing. You only focus on what CPU is doing and you look what CPU needs to do and you optimize it in such a way that is the most efficient and the most effective way of achieving the result. So it is uh, focused on CPU cycles and you want to achieve as much as possible in a single CPU cycle um, and not related to programming um, in higher level languages. Um, so CISC um, has uh, several, maybe eight uh, general purpose registers with special registers. Special register, for example, the accumulator is kind of a special on the x86 design. So you have, you know, A, B, C, D, you know, four registers. Sometimes you have more. Uh, but not more than couple. Uh, so let's say up to eight. Uh, and then you have special register uh, that um, is treated you know, specifically. Like you can do the special register is used for um, arithmetic logic uh, operations. So we have a unit on inside the CPU called arithmetic logic unit, which is responsible for doing the you know, binary operations, the NAND, AND, OR, XOR, and so on, uh, and or uh, some arithmetic addition, multiplication, and, and so on. And usually the accumulator is kind of, kind of needed to be the result or needed to be the, the operand, right? Another thing CISC is doing is uh, it allows uh, operations uh, operations to use resources resources from memory um, so if I have a particular memory location somewhere and I have some number in there I can have an instruction which says take this number increment it and put the result back into memory right so memory can be used uh, from uh, it allows, kind of arithmetic logic unit operations to use resources from memory. Uh, RISC doesn't allow that. So in RISC um, has many registers, registers, uh, 128, some have even 256 registers. Um, none is special. All can be used for ALU operations. Right, so the difference is RISC CPUs have huge number of registers uh, and all of them can be used for arithmetic operations, uh, but you cannot, you cannot use memory for ALU operations. That's the, and that's the kind of the reason why RISC architectures are often called uh, store load store architecture because I can only do operations with registers. So, you know, what do I do? I, I need to load something from memory to the register. So I need to have a load and store operations to load something to register and store something in memory. Uh, and then I can do everything else on those registers, but those are slow, right? So I O operation reading from memory and doing those operations are slow. Uh, ALU operations, um, ALU operations are fast. And not only they are fast, they are predictably fast because I know exactly they all of those operations will take only one cycle, right? So almost on all risk 
CPUs, uh, we can assume uh, that one operation takes one CPU cycle, right? What does it mean? Well, it means I can kind of predict certain things. So if I have a program and it needs to do those kind of uh, operations, I know exactly when I will get to this point. I know exactly how many CPU cycles I need to get to this point. And for example, I also know that none of those operations uses IO, doesn't read anything to register or to, to do something in memory, but this operation reads something in memory. So what I can do, I can start this operation before I need the data, such that when I get there, I will already have the data, right? So for example, if my IO operation, let's say take eight cycles, right? Uh, I can start it eight operations earlier for, uh, for load. Uh, so if I'm uh, reading something from memory and it takes eight, eight cycles, I can start it early and have it ready, right? Uh, with CISC, um, each operation takes, how long operation takes, it depends. It's much harder to predict how long things take because each operation takes more, you know, different amount of time. And some operations will use registers only, they will be fast. Some operations will use memory and they will be slow. And some operations mix things such that, you know, I, I kind of, it's much harder to predict where I will be and what can I read ahead of time such that it will become usable. It is possible, but it's much harder, right? So you do need to spend more energy and more resources doing that. This is kind of different, right? So those are kind of the main, main differences. Um, so CISC, um, because of this complexity, the, the, um, it, it needs to decode what needs to be done and it kind of have multiple stages of that. So it needs to say, okay, is it a simple operation or complex operation? Okay, it is a simple operation. Okay, so which registers will I use those? Okay, no, and then it kind of does whatever it needs. Or it's a complex operation, then how complex it is, or it needs some data from, from RAM. Okay, then I need to go to RAM and read it and, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, Cisco also has variable length instructions. So the, the size of the instruction can be up to 15 bytes, you know? It, it can be a, a single byte for a very trivial operations like incrementing something in the register. Usually it is three bytes because it's just the opcode for the operation and the opcode for which registers is the input and output. So I need to address them. So usually three bytes is sufficient or maybe even less, but sometimes I need to have an address of memory and like what to do. So I may need up to 18 bytes. And then, um, you know, as I said, complex instructions map better between high level languages, programming languages and what the CPU is doing. So this mapping is super, super easy. And then the compilers are kind of having easier time working out how to use it, right? Uh, or if humans are doing it, right? And then various instructions can use IO, we already talked about it. And then you can use ALU operands from memory. We already talked about it, right? So then risk much simpler instructions, uh, clear separation between what ALU is doing and what I need to read and write to memory. Uh, so store load architecture. I never do operations on memory, so I can only do operations on registers. One instructions per CPU cycle, highly optimized. We already talked about it. Fixed instruction set. So most RISC CPU designs, they will use a, a, a four bytes always for decoding instructions. So I know those four bytes decode always the same line, the, the same way what needs to be done. So it, the decoding is much simpler. Uh, and then you have many, many registers and you have kind of a trick. So if you have normal x86 architecture and you, you call the function, right? So let's say you're executing a function and you are inside your CPU and the CPU is executing this function, right? So I have kind of a cache for data and I have my, my stack. So I, I pass some parameters. They are passed into the registers, uh, into this function. And then I, I'm kind of doing some logic, some, some operations. I'm maybe reading something from RAM, putting some partial results into the, uh, the registers. And then I'm calling another function, right? So what will happen? 
when I call another function from within this function? Well, I have to put all the state, all the state of the registers and my kind of state of the, where I am with my calculations onto the stack and then start executing this instruction, load the parameters into registers and start doing the logic of this, of this function, right? And this process of storing the, the kind of the frame on the stack. And then when this function call finishes, I have to load back the context into the registers and everything is quite time consuming, right? Because I have to kind of clean everything to prepare my CPU to do this new function. And then when this function finishes, restore the state, you know, one line after the, the previous instruction was called such that I continue my computations, right? So with, because on the risk architecture, I have 128 registers. I loaded my function, I'm executing it. I have parameters into my uh, registers, but you never have 128 parameters to your function. You know, you may have one or two parameters. You may be using like, you know, four or, 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 or even less registers for the function. So what they do is they, they say, okay, we limit your ability inside the function to use only eight registers. And then when this function calls another function, instead of wiping those registers, I just move to the next free slot and I load those parameters of the new function call to those new clean registers. I start executing it and I have another function. I, I keep doing that. And then when the third function finishes, I just shift it back to this slot and I continue doing what I was doing. I don't need to cache anything because it's all there. And then when this function finishes, it goes back and again, it has all the state as it was before I called that function, right? So I don't need to move um, my state into the stack or somewhere else, but I can kind of reuse it. So it's much better improved subcalls um, logistics and kind of a cache cache reuse, right? So my cache, um, yeah, that's right. So if you have a, if you have recursion, which is too big, then the whole thing collapses. Then I have to start putting stuff onto the stack, right? So if I kind of uh, moved myself enough that I'm kind of, usually they implemented in a form of a circular buffer. So I'm kind of going around and the moment I'm, I will overwrite the existing state, the CPU says, oh shit, uh, we have to put it into the stack because we, we run out of space, right? And then it becomes slow, right? But up to those 16 recursions, you, you have it super fast. Good point, Tomasz. Um, so that's kind of the risk architecture, right? So as a simple example, if I have a constant 13 and I have an address in memory, uh, risk will need three instructions, right? So it will need load data from this memory to register R1 add 13 to R1 and store the new value of R1 to the memory, right? Makes, makes it simple, perfect sense. And then Cisc will have just one instruction. It will say add 13 to this address, right? And it will load the value of the, of the address incremented by 13 and put it back in a single instruction. But this instruction is much more complex, right? So the funny thing is uh, since Pentium Pro, <laughs> Intel uses a micro operations and basically compiles this instruction to three simple instructions, which are kind of looking like this. <laughs> so internally, what Intel CPUs are doing, they are internally using kind of a built-in, you, you may say kind of a compiler inside the CPU, which decodes the complex instructions of the CISC architecture into something that looks like RISC. Right, they called it micro operations, and then the the Intel CPU will you know execute those three simple operations. Right, so what do you think about this? What are the drawbacks and benefits of CISC compared to just this? You know, at at the end of the day, the CPU needs to execute those three instructions. And in the context of risk, those instructions are kind of a native code. This is what the programs get compiled into. This is, this is the program that the CPU needs to execute. In the 
case of CISC, this is the program it's given to the CPU, but in fact, it will need to turn it into those, into this internally, right? So, well, it will use more energy. It will use, it will be more complex. It will use extra logic to do this conversions, this kind of com compilation step, right? So I, I don't really see, um, so ki kind of a drawback is um, energy time usage inside CPU to achieve the same result in case of CISC, right? The benefit is that, again, we, we have those nice complex instructions. So compiling stuff into this is kind of a little bit easier, right? Um, that's right. So, so risks usually will be faster. And risks will be simpler. And the risk will be um, less energy uh, hungry. They will they will run cooler in a, in a sense. Exactly, it's like compiling in advance, right? So kind of compiling ahead of time, uh, and then you just have the compiled version, and then you just need to run it. You don't need to to deal with it, right? Um, so th there is a lot of drawbacks for the CISC architecture actually. Uh, the benefit that they used to have, which was this mapping between the logic of what needs to be done to what the CPU is doing, th th that benefit is not important anymore. It, it used to be important when we didn't have good compilers, but nowadays, I mean, it is still done automatically, right? You see from the, your programming language through this to this, everything is automated. So you can just do it ahead of time. Um, all right, so is ARM only for mobile? Uh, not really. Um, so ARM is used in servers as well. Uh, there is a, a, a large uh, Fujitsu supercomputer which has almost 159,000 nodes and each node, which means CPUs, and each CPU has 52 cores um, per node. Um, and they have kind of like um, normal x86 have additional instructions called like SIMT a uh, single instruction, multiple, multiple data, kind of like an SSE kind of extensions or MIMT. Um, they are used for doing a lot of things at the same time on multiple data. So you have a single instruction, but you, for example, adding uh, data from 128 different uh, locations at the same time, right? Um, and ARM architecture has similar thing called scalable vector extensions. So instead of SIMT, they, they have this acronym. Uh, and it is based on the ARM CPU, right? Um, so interestingly enough, up to 2005, Apple was using PowerPC and PowerPC is a Motorola, um, no, that, that, that was IBM actually. Um, Motorola was a different chip. Um, and, but anyway, th th those are kind of examples of RISC architectures as well. Um, so in 2006, Mac switched to using 64 bits Intel CPUs and they were using them for yeah, almost 15 years, over 15 years. And now Apple moves back to RISC. So they are kind of shifting uh, from CISC architecture to, to RISC because it has those kind of benefits. It, it tends to be faster. It tends to be simpler. It tends to be more optimized for doing concurrency inside the CPU because you can do multiple things at the same time because they are more predictable predictable. Decoding and encoding instructions is simpler. Um, and, the, and they usually run in a fraction of wattage what is needed for the for the CISC. Um, so who is ARM? ARM is a spin-off. Uh, there was a company called Acorn Computers, a British company, uh, which got kind of split in 91. Uh, and it got funds from Apple and another company, and they kind of spun off from, from Acorn. And Acorn was an acronym for one of the projects which they did, uh, which was called Acorn Risk Machine, which was the acronym was ARM. Uh, and ARM doesn't really produce CPUs. Uh, they only produce CPU designs and they sell those CPU designs to other manufacturers. So they sell it to Samsung, they sell it to Qualcomm, they sell it to AMD. Uh, even Intel is using some of the ARM designs for some of the controllers on like our network cards and, and so on. NVIDIA, Fujitsu. So 
they have their own manufacturing processes and they use the designs to produce the chips and anybody can kind of buy a particular design and, and, and use it. So as I was saying, IMD is using uh, TSMC, uh, which mastered the five and seven nanometer technology and Intel has kind of a trouble, um, you know, moving to the lower dimensions. Um, so back to Apple, as I was saying also, Apple was using ARM for a very long time. And, you know, Apple had a stake in ARM since 91, right? So they had interest and they were using the designs from ARM for a lot of the mobile chipsets. And they are producing their own, uh, their own chips called Apple A something, right? So we are up to A13 um, or A14 now even. Um, and we have kind of a eight core designs which are available already uh, and they are used for some of the kind of um, uh, PC type of uh, devices. So th this will be much more power hungry than your mobile chips, but it will still be less power hungry than kind of an x86 equivalent. Um, so it is kind of an, an interesting kind of a, a journey uh, and the tension between CISC and RISC kind of continues. And um, I don't know, you know, nobody knows what, what the future will bring, but I am quite excited to see Apple going with RISC because, you know, for 20 years, I thought RISC was a better architecture, right? Same as I'm thinking Dvorak is a better keyboard layout, right? But we still use QWERTY and we still use x86. You know, why? Well, because it, you know, it's more convenient, like a lot of designs and a lot of things are based on the, the historical choices. And even though the historical choices are not optimal, they, the cost of converting to something new sometimes is too big, right? So, when, uh, when Intel tried with Itanium to change this, to break away from x86, it failed, right? So the last attempt of giving up on x86, we, we, we did in 2001, and that was a failed experiment, right? So now, fast forward, we have 2020, and we kind of doing this experiment again. We, we have Apple trying to migrate from x86 into risk and maybe this time it will stick maybe this time more pcs and more kind of a high end uh, devices will end up using risk which will lower the cost of people developing software for it and compilers being developed for it and, and so on and so forth such that we can depart from the lock in that we had for you know yeah almost 40 years in the kind of the x86 world. So I don't know, uh, AMD is already benefiting from five nanometers. Intel needs to catch up. Uh, Apple will continue developing their own chips, same as the Fujitsu, same as um, other manufacturers, Samsung, Qualcomm, and so on. And they are all pushing risk, right? None of the modern designs is based on CISC uh, architecture. They all based on kind of risk. Um, ARM will definitely continue to dominate mobile markets because we don't really have any viable alternative there. They are very low power, high performance chips. Uh, we don't have any competition. Uh, and then ARM is kind of moving towards the server side space as well. So we have the Neoverse N1 CPU, which is used in some of the Amazon um, high performance um, offerings. So it is kind of an interesting space to watch and for, for programmers and for computer scientists, it kind of doesn't matter too much, but it matters in the bigger picture because of the incompatibility of those two worlds. You cannot easily port a RISC compiler to support the CISC and, and vice versa. They have to be completely redesigned and they have kind of a different um, objectives. Um, yes, so power is the, um, the, the power efficiency is the main factor. So Nikolai question is it the power that domin that dictates it. And the answer is yes, you cannot make x86 or any CISC CPU to be as efficient power wise as the risk architecture. Uh, 
because of the complexity of decoding the instructions and what the CPU needs to do. Basically, the CPU needs to do much more work. And this work costs time and it costs kind of energy. Uh, with ARM, they are much simpler, they are much easier, uh, and they, by design, co produce much less energy. So the funny thing is, for example, the original, uh, the original, uh, so, so, you know, Pentium CPUs, yeah, about 65 watts, right? CPUs, I mean, we, we had CPUs which were like 120 watts or more, right? But the modern, modern era CPUs, yeah, you can say it's about 65 watts, right? Um, the first ARM that was designed, ARM1, uh, they had a plastic cover which would melt if the CPU heated more than one watt. <laughs> so one watt was the maximum the CPU would survive, right? If you hit it more than one watt, it would just melt, right? So <laughs> actually the, the initial CPU was using uh, 100 milliwatts, right? It was 10, 10, 10 times lower, right? So the, the first ARM CPU was using 100 milliwatts. We, we never had CPUs in milliwatts when we are talking about CISC, right? Um, so th the gap is huge. Um, yeah. All right, so um, I thought I kind of interested you a little bit into the, the CPU uh, designs. Um, I did spend, as I said, quite a lot of time learning about risk because we need to learn about those uh, call windows and how to optimize it and how to make kind of efficiency uh, decisions about the, the usage of registers and, and so on on the uh, risk architecture because as I said, we did program certain things in assembly, and then you have full control of how you lay out things for yourself. Um, but they also made it really hard. Like I was quite, um, I knew how to program assembly for x86, and kind of I knew like how, how to do things. But when I moved to risk, I said, shit, it's like so hard. Like you don't have instructions to do stuff. You, you need to be very verbose. It's like, you know, going from high level language to, to dealing with pointers, okay? <laughs> it, 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 it's, it felt like step back, but in a retrospect, I kind of liked it. And I, I thought risk architectures do have a lot of benefits, which, you know, probably should come up at some point, and they seem to be coming up now. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the future will bring, but it is kind of an interesting space and interesting developments. And I think Apple moving away from CISC is a very interesting development uh, in that space because interesting thing may happen uh, after that. Okay, any questions? Related to the second half. No questions. All right, so that's it for today. Um, as I said, uh, we will have a break next week. So focus on your projects. And then we will do some uh, project reviews uh, 3rd or 4th of uh, November. So have a good day. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.